Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for tuning in to this episode of Trending Echoes brought to you by Trends Research and Advisory. Very excited to be here at the beautiful Expo City in the heart of Dubai, joined by a very, very special guest today. Very excited to have her uh, coming all the way from Oman. We are joined by Rometha El Busaidi. Uh, Rometha, today's theme, health, relief, recovery, and peace. Talk to us a little bit more about sustainability and how all of that connects together. So I would say um, a very interesting piece of research that has shown climate anxiety in general has really increased all over the world. If we look more on the younger generation, specifically the Arab youth generation, it has doubled just in the mere five years from today. Right. Um, and as a result of that, I think for a lot of young people, they think of the existential issues that are happening with the climate. Like we all share the same destiny at the end of the day if things don't work out. Um, and as a result of that, I think this specific piece on health and mental health specifically is very important as we navigate these spaces of climate change. And everyone now has a personal story of how they have been impacted by climate change as well. Now, uh, I believe recently you had a TED talk that got over a million views and it has to do with women's roles in sustainability. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about that. So my TED talk really talks about women being the key of the climate future. Um, and that's by looking at various uh, studies that have actually actually shown as well that the number one solution to get into mitigating climate change is by empowering women and educating girls and women as well. Um, and a lot of people might contest and say, what does that have to do with climate? Um, if we actually look into how we were raised and how we were brought up, a lot of the values that we have on conserving water, turning off the tap when you brush your teeth, um, conserving electricity. I mean, you have it already. Who taught you that? It's your own mother. Right. So these are that multiplier effect that women actually have in their own communities to empower you to be able to do those sustainable practices as well. Right. And as we continue doing that, you'd be able to actually do amazing stuff by mitigating climate change through women. Very interesting, because for a second, when you're talking about women being you know, a key element uh, when it comes to sustainability. In my own mind, I was actually thinking the same thing. Oh, come on, what does that have to do with anything? And so you actually gave me that example, and I was like, that kind of makes sense. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, Now, talk to us a little bit about your involvement with the NGOs as well. Sure. So I, uh, there's various NGOs, but the main one that I um, am a board member in is the Environment Society of Amman, which is the only environmental NGO in Amman. I'm also part of the Arab Youth Council for Climate Change, which is some sort of a, NGO in its own right as well, really pushing forward Arab youth representation, specifically when it comes to climate. Um, for the Environment Society, we do of Urban, we do a lot of research and advocacy, specifically when it comes to marine and terrestrial life. So we complement a lot of these research that has been happening in the Armani coastal waters and in the terrestrial lands on various species like the Arabian humpback whale. Um, the marine turtles that we have, uh, in addition to the frankincense tree, which a lot of people know as, as Luban, and it smells really nice and people are so used to it. But they are also endangered and you need to really protect them and do an, a lot of data as well to ensure that decision making is being able to um, use that data as well in the right way. Um, in the Arab Council, uh, Arab Youth uh, Council for Climate Change, we do a lot of that work. We've actually con um, I collaborated with Trends as well on a really interesting piece of research that we will be announcing on day five or day six, which is Energy Day. Um, and that's all about uh, youth perceptions and what they think about um, COP28 at the moment and what their policy recommendations are going to be to world leaders who are currently here discussing this same issue. So that's going to be a very interesting uh, piece of research. I'm as actually well. curious, mm. what do the youth think about COP28 in your opinion? I can't reveal much. You'd have to actually download be the there. report. But what I right. would say, the report will be okay. made available so you can sure. go and search for it. But what I would say is for a lot of young people, they, uh, Arab youth specifically, they believe that their governments need to step up even further than what they have been uh, done. A lot of the perception is there's a lot of mitigation, which is the energy transition that we're hearing. 
but there's not much on adaptation and nature-based solutions in order for us to be able to adapt to what's happening in our own countries. So that's one perception. Um, another interesting one was if they believe that the loss and damage fund mm -hmm. will be operationalized. And they were hopeful. Uh, they believe that that is possible to be done in this COP. So, yeah, um, an interesting thing as well is while climate anxiety is up, they're also hopeful that there is a way to turn this around and be able to really uh, move things in the right direction as well. I actually wasn't familiar with that term, climate anxiety. That's that's a thing. Yes. And it it's means exactly pretty yeah. much what it sounds like. People yeah. that get anxiety because of, of the climate, climate change. Yeah. So I'll give you an example of young Armanis right now who live in the coast who have cyclones pretty much every year now. So you have a cyclone that happens every year and the severity varies. But based on actual research that has been done, the expectation of a severe cyclone impacting the coast once every five years. And were these that cyclones are, not there before? No. I mean, before 2007, ask anybody. I mean, not to challenge the idea of it, yeah, right? Yeah, but yeah. I mean, if we talk about a cyclone, cyclones happen. They've been happening throughout you know, Yeah, but not the to the degree or category that have. So right. I'll give you an example. 2007, <clears throat> Oman had its most severe cyclone. Uh, Cyclone Gonu, that's Category 5, very mm. similar to Katrina right. in the U.S. Wow. Nobody talks about how severe that was. Right. Uh, the losses that were ex impacted Oman then was $4.2 billion U.S. dollars, just one cyclone. Wow. And now you have these recurrent ones since 2007 till now. I mean, we can I can count five from the top of my head that were impactful, that impacted the coast of Oman. And what what, what has caused this in Climate change. Okay. So yeah. changes in temperatures, uh, pressure zones. So you have more low pressure zones that really kind of bring in a lot of these atmospheric differences that really cultivate this. It's become a breeding ground of cyclones that are much more prevalent now. Um, the ice cap melting in the Himalayas as well has a connection with the fact that we have a low, low pressure zone right now in the Arabian See, for instance. So that is one of the main reasons. Climate Very change. interesting how um, certain things that take place in one part of the earth could affect a completely different part. We were having a talk yesterday, I think it was with uh, Mr. Mustafa Rawi, the uh, acting director of CNN uh, Saudia, and he was talking about, uh, if you remember, uh, acid rain, mm -hmm. right? And how the UK had caused quite a lot of that because of the pollution. And the acid rain would actually shift because of the winds and affect other parts of the world. Yeah. So very interesting you talk about that. So uh, what what is taking place now in Oman to be able to prevent a lot of things? Are we making enough progress, in your opinion, whether in Oman, the UAE, or in the Middle East in general? Are we doing enough to actually be able to combat this? Some people out there, I mean, again, I don't know if, if this is valid, but you know, you have people on both ends of the spectrum. And you have people that say we've gone way too far beyond the point of recovery and there's no turning back at this point. Mm -hmm. So are we doing enough and can we actually reverse things in your opinion? So I personally <coughs> believe that we can if we actually have the collective will to do it and not kind of go through the whole politics of things of you did this, you did that. If we actually come together and it has shown time and time again it's human nature that if we come together towards one goal we're capable of doing it. It doesn't matter who you are. Um, with that said, if enough has been done, I would actually echo every young person to say that there's still much more to be done. Yes, amazing things have been done so far in the region. Um, every, every single country so far I would say is climate forward, which is a breath of fresh air because five years ago that wasn't the case. Um, there are a lot of commitments. A lot of them are actually doubling their commitments um, and even tripling their commitments. Uh, we're seeing uh, regions in the Arab world or countries in the Arab world th that are very much forward in terms of looking at other energy transition measures. But also I think we can also be um, the area where we can actually ex export our knowledge when it comes to mangrove trans uh, restoration and whatnot, because we're very well known for that as well. So I think it's a, we've done a lot of great things when it comes to both adaptation and mitigation, but the mass, it's not enough for us to reach that goal and we need to do more. And that can only be happen, I would say, not only necessarily on 
pushing forward just that the government can do this. It's a whole collective effort, whether it's me and you as individuals, whether it's my role as an advocate in the organizations I work for, where I choose to put my money in, where I choose to spend my time at, and additionally, how we can all come together, private sector, government, and civil society to work towards that goal. Uh, Are there certain measurable elements that could be put into place to say, we have done enough, we've done 50%, or we've achieved what we need to do because in a lot of the cases we talk about, you know, we haven't done enough. We still have to go further. Uh, If we talk about the, uh, I think it was 1.5 degrees, right? Uh, I I think we've gone the other way and we're seeing an increase, right? So what, what are some of the measuring tools or how can we gauge our actual progress? Is there a way to gauge our progress? I would say where we are right now is the perfect example of how we can kind of gauge that. COP28, the global a global stock, stock take, for instance, is going to do would that. Would you consider COP28 a success? And if so, why? I don't know. Right. Uh, Until okay. the end of COP28, that's when. But so far, when it comes to main issues of oper- operationalizing loss and damage, literally m- a month ago, we would have said it would not have right. happened. It's happening. It happened on the first day. So I would say it is literally the cop of action, but I I won't be able to tell you Mm -hmm. if it's a success until the really last day of COP28, but we have those in place. So COP is the way that we can actually gauge where we are at, and it's a matter of everyone stepping forward, uh, be it the historical emitters and the current emitters as well, coming together to ensure that those targets are actually set. Mm-hmm. When we talk about the global stock take, we're still far behind because we're still at 2.4 perhaps. We're yet to drop to 2 and 1.5, right. which is very crucial for us to do. Uh, something interesting was told to me yesterday that it's kind of ironic that you have uh, you know, one of the biggest sustainability environmental events taking place and you have all these world leaders literally flying into this event. And, uh, you know, the person I was talking to was a bit you know, sarcastic about it. Like, it, it's just very ironic. Um, is it necessary? I mean, we can use the example of COVID, right? Right. Uh, we were all very disconnected, all used online tools and whatnot. Right. From our own experience, I think we could say that face-to-face is way more important to kind of pass on that message Mm -hmm. and make sure that things are really moving forward and really bringing momentum forward. Um, With that said, yes, there is an acknowledgement that definitely there is a lot of fossil fuels being burnt at the moment just on the fact that we're having this meeting. But we have to keep in mind that it needs to be inclusive. And if any other... I can't find any other way that it can be as inclusive as an in-person meeting because we have to keep in mind that not everyone in the world has internet connectivity, not Mm -hmm. everyone in the world has electricity, not everyone in the world has a lot of the perks that we have in first world issues, that we're actually the ones that are commenting on this. It's very important to bring in indigenous voices who have opted not to have technology, for instance. So I think an (coughs) in-person meeting is very crucial and very important to have everyone's voice heard and their decisions also made on the table rather than just having the same issue that we would have had we have, have had it online, right? Absolutely. What are Brometa's expected? What would you like to see as an end result for COP28? We're talking about Brometa here. More women participation. I mean, we could just look at the picture of COP28 and the presidency in every single world leader and there were way more men than women. I think we need more women. Um, Why is and that? Number one solution to really right. mitigate climate change. That's my message. It has always Why been that here? women are the key climate. Okay, well, so why aren't they here? It's this hierarchy. It's the structure. It's how societies have been built. It's a lot of things. If we go on to this, it will, I, th- we'll I was going to say, I think we're going down tangent. another road. <laughs> but um, in addition to that, I think we need more young people to be taken seriously and being t- and be included at the decision-making table, which has been amazing with this COP specifically, where um, there has been a specific youth champion that has been appointed just to ensure that youth voices are included. And I hope that that will be taken forward and moving on further. And the final thing is that a lot of, like for instance, for me, it's already a victory that there's an operationalizing of the loss and damage. But the other um, main things when it comes to climate financing specifically, Hopefully we've reached that goal by this COP. So uh, again, thanks to Trends for making this platform available. We've got a voice. And with this 
being here. What sort of message do you have for the viewers, for the listeners? What does Romeitha want to say to people? Um, so my message is very simple. You are the agent of change. You can really make a difference. And not necessarily when you think of yourself as an individual, but you actually work for an organization of some sort that is able to make a difference as well. So utilize the platforms that you already have in order for you to pass on the message and the dream that you actually have for the future of the world. Climate anxiety is at at an all-time high. I think together we can all work together to kind of reduce that and make sure that our future generations really uh, enjoy Earth. Romaitha, thank you so much for all the insight. It was absolutely amazing. We look forward to having you once again, hopefully soon. Hopefully. Thank you so much. All right, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That was another episode of Trending Echoes. Thanks for tuning in. And we are going to be here once again tomorrow. Uh, My name was Omar. I was your host, and I look forward to seeing you once again.